heroes speak to a need deep inside us. They are examples to live by, cautionary tales, or sometimes a way to celebrate our culture. But what makes the heroic myth so enduring? And how would you create heroic myths for your world? Today, we'll explore some heroic myths from around the world and discuss how fantasy world builders can create their own heroic myths and embed those myths in the cultures of their world. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Just before we get into today's video, if, if you want to help me make more of these videos and maybe get some cool merch, you can check out my store on Spring where you can get shirts like this one, which has got a nice little meme going on about pantsing. There's some world builder memes and there are some just plain old merch from my channel. So if you would like to support me, check out that store and know that I appreciate every one of you who've bought a shirt. Okay, enough of that. Let's get cracking with heroic myths. Heroic myths serve as the bedrock of many cultures, embodying ideals, shaping beliefs and influencing behaviors. These narratives play a crucial role in reinforcing communal values and constructing a collective memory for a culture. So let's take a look at some practical examples of this by analyzing two myths, one from Africa and, and the other from the Navajo people of America. Did I say that right? Is it Navajo? Navajo? Let me know in the comments how you say that word, Nav Navajo. I would say it Navaju, but it might be Navaju. I don't know. Our first example myth is the Lion King of Mali. Sundaita Keita is the founder of the Mali Empire and a legendary figure in West African history. The bare bones of the story is that his birth was prophesied as a great king if his father married an ugly woman. His father was already married and had a son, but polygamy was an accepted practice, so when he was presented with a hunchback woman, he married again and she gave birth to Sundiata. He was born with a disability and was mocked in his childhood for this disability. When his father died, his brother, the son from the first marriage, became king and Sundiata and his mother had to go into exile. Sundiata overcame his disability by using a stick from a boabab tree and went on to become a great warrior. However, it is notable that he did not face his brother in combat. He didn't go back and reclaim his throne. Instead, what happened was a great Ghanaian empire arose and crushed the kingdom that his brother was the king of. When this happened, the people turned to Sundiata and he forged an alliance to oppose the Ghana Empire and led this alliance to victory, founding the Mali Empire. At least that's the version of the myth that I know. Now, these deeds are chronicled in the poem, The Epic of Sundiata. And if we take a look at the values espoused here, we can see the morals that the myth tries to emulate and pass down to the people of the culture. Sundiata's story imparts lessons about destiny and leadership, perseverance and humility. Born with a disability, Sundiata faced ridicule and was exiled from his kingdom. However, he rose against all odds to reclaim his throne and establish one of the most significant empires in African history without fighting his brother. Instead, he just stepped up to help his people when his brother's kingdom fell. The story emphasizes the idea that adversities can be overcome and that true leadership is a combination of strength and compassion and perhaps a touch of destiny. So that was the story from the Mali Empire. But now let's turn to, that, to those heroic twins. Often heroic myths do serve as an origin story for a given culture, or is set in the early years of such a culture. And so it is with the hero twins from the Navajo mythology. The hero twins, Monster Slayer and Born for Water, are pivotal figures renowned for their heroic endeavors. 
They were conceived from the union between the earth goddess changing women and the sun, and these twins are born with the vital task of protecting the people by eradicating the monsters terrorizing the land. The twins, while strong and determined, often sought assistance during their journeys. One such essential ally that helped them was the spider woman, who sent them to the sun, their father, to gather weapons for their fight. The sun tested their worthiness and resolve. The twins had to traverse four perilous mountains, each associated with a cardinal direction, and they had to face the challenge presented therein. These trials, designed to test and strengthen their abilities, were instrumental in preparing them for the formidable monsters they would later encounter. Throughout their adventures, the Euro twins established foundational Navajo rituals, and their stories served as both moral tales and explanations for the natural world around the Navajo people. The Euro twins' journey is a classic representation of the battle between good and evil. Their endeavors emphasize virtues such as bravery, cooperation, and resilience. Additionally, the twins' connection to the natural elements one being associated with storms and the other with calm waters, signifies balance and the duality of nature, which is, strength, uh, which is central to the Navajo worldview. The myth stretches across quite a few monsters, and each monster or beast that they fight teaches different morals and values of the Navajo people. Some of the monsters are actually not beaten at all, just prevented from affecting humans by means of inventing devices like a comb for lice. So, thinking about both of these myths that we've discussed, you can quite clearly see the pivotal role that heroic myths play in molding cultures, dictating values, and fostering a shared sense of identity. Through these narratives, people are inspired to emulate the heroes, understanding that they too can overcome challenges, make sacrifices for the greater good, and achieve greatness. So clearly, to have a rich culture in a fantasy world, you need a few myths to bolster your cultural values. So we will get to how you can create myths of your own. But if you enjoyed these two myths and their brief analysis and the impact they had on the cultures, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about the structure of a heroic myth. The structure of heroic myths across various cultures, while varied in the details, often does adhere to a common framework. This structure helps make the narrative relatable and memorable, ensuring that its lessons are deeply embedded within the psyche of the audience. Joseph Campbell, of course, famously analyzed this in his hero's journey, and I'm not going to hit that level of detail in this video, but I will give the structure that, in my opinion, highlights the heroic myth that is generally adhered to. And I'll illustrate those highlights by referencing the journey to the West, the Monkey King uh, myth, and the myth of Jason and the Argonauts. So, first up, the call to adventure. The hero is often called to leave their everyday world, either through external events or a personal desire. This step highlights the importance of change, adaptability, and stepping out of one's comfort zone. Life is filled with unexpected turns, and it is our courage to accept and face these changes that defines our growth. So we can see this in Jason and the Argonauts, where Jason is tasked with retrieving the Golden Fleece from Colsus to reclaim his rightful throne in Euclid. The quest is not just about regaining the throne, but also about proving his worth. In Journey to the West, the Monkey King is born from a stone and quickly seeks to establish himself among the gods and immortals. His rebellious nature leads him to challenge the celestial order, earning the ire of the Jade Emperor and setting him up in a conflict with the celestial bureaucracy. So on the one hand, you have Jason, who is classically tasked with a heroic quest, but you also have the contrasting call to adventure, the Monkey King, where he enters heaven and he is now embroiled in this conflict to prove his worth. Second, the infamous trials. 
as the hero embarks on their journey, they encounter numerous obstacles and adversaries that will test their strength, wit, and character. The challenges faced by the hero reflect life's inevitable hardships, and by overcoming them, the myth communicates the idea that with perseverance, resilience, and intelligence, one can overcome even the most formidable difficulties. The specific values of the culture is often embedded in these trials. If you want to showcase bravery as a cultural trait, the hero should learn to be brave here. The same for whatever other cultural values you want to emphasize. From wit to endurance to whatever else your culture values, you want that to feature in these trials. And we can see that again in our examples. Uh, Jason, throughout his journey, he and his crew face a whole heap of challenges. They have to battle harpies. They have to confront the bronze giant Talos. They have to navigate the clashing rocks. And through all of these things, Jason learns the power of loyalty and friendship and depending on his crew, which to me is the central lesson of the Golden Fleece part of that adventure. Journey to the West, the Monkey King, on the other hand, his initial adventure sees him defeating various champions of the Jade Emperor, and he tries to claim the title of Jade Emperor for himself. But the Buddha is called for, and ultimately the Buddha imprisons the Monkey King for 500 years. So despite his strong start, our boy is placed in quite a nasty situation underneath a mountain where he needs to learn humility. And that brings us to three, assistance or guidance from a mentor or uh, another supernatural being or another hero. So often the hero encounters a guide, a mentor or supernatural force that provides them with advice, tools or skills for their journey. No one achieves greatness in isolation. The this phase emphasizes the importance of seeking guidance, accepting help, and recognizing that wisdom can come from unexpected sources. Ideally, you want your mentor figures here to embody some part of the culture that you want to emphasize. But remember, they should teach the hero, not supplant them. Ultimately, the hero is the one who needs to achieve the overcome of the story, even in a myth orientated towards the people in your world. So examples of this, Jason receives help from the sorceress Medea, who ultimately falls in love with him, and with her magical abilities, she helps Jason in tasks like subduing the dragon that guards the golden fleece. And as for the monkey king, after his capture and punishment by the Buddha, the monkey king is given a chance for redemption by accompanying the monk Sangzen, on a journey to the west to retrieve the sacred scriptures. The Buddha gives him a magical circlet that Sangzen can tighten, causing the monkey king pain if he misbehaves. And this serves as a tool and a reminder to stay on the righteous path. The mentor might often die before hitting the climax, but not always. Sometimes the mentor can go with the hero into the climax. And speaking of the climax, let's talk about the fourth steps, the abyss, or otherwise known as the climax of the story, or the whole, the place where it all comes together. So this is the point of greatest challenge for the hero. They might face a profound personal crisis, confront their worst fears, or battle their most powerful enemy. The abyss symbolizes the confrontations we must have with our deepest fears and insecurity. By facing them head on, we can achieve self-realization and transformation. This is the core of the myth, the moment when the hero learns the most important lesson that is central to the whole story. So examples, again, Jason, the climax of Jason and the Golden Fleece arises when he is tasked with yoking fire-breathing oxen, sowing dragon's teeth, and then battling the warriors that spring forth from the sown teeth. With the aid of Medea and the Argonauts, he overcomes these challenges, and that, for me, is the central theme of Jason's journey. It's the importance of love and loyalty. At least, the importance of the journey up to the point where he retrieves the Golden Fleece. 
it all goes to heck after that anyway. So let's just focus on the lesson up to that point, which is love and loyalty. We'll get to the return home. Anyway, the Monkey King. For the Monkey King, it's a bit different. His ultimate test isn't just the external foes, but his internal transformation from a rebellious deity to a protector and a devotee of the Dharma. That is an internal conflict that comes to a resolution in his battle with a, with a uh, circlet and the whole journey there and back and how much of a changed entity he is when he returns home. And that brings us to the transformation and the return. So having confronted and overcome their greatest challenge, the hero emerges transformed, often possessing newfound wisdom or abilities. They then return to their original world to share their learnings and rejuvenate their community. This last step is supposed to show the hero returning a changed person. So with Jason, he's got the golden fleece in his possession. He returns to Equalus. He's not just a prince, but a proven hero. However, Jason's story ends in tragedy. There's a whole bunch of tragedies that just cascade it all the way down. And this does sometimes, this does uh, somewhat tarnish that homecoming. But let, let's not dwell. Let's not dwell. Let's move on to the Monkey King. The Monkey King, by the end of the journey, has protected the monk throughout the perilous quests. He's demonstrated his loyalty, his bravery, and his growth. And as a reward for his service and transformation, he is granted Buddhahood and he becomes the victorious fighting Buddha. So his story ends great after spending some time underneath that mountain. Why does this kind of structure matter and do you really need to use it? Well, yes, but also don't marry it. So let's first talk about why it's important. There are a couple of reasons why this kind of structure does help a heroic myth. Firstly, it's relatability. The universal structure ensures that the story feels familiar, making it easier for listeners to see themselves in the hero's shoes and thus derive personal lessons from the narrative. Then there's a certain amount of predictability. The structured progression allows listeners to anticipate and reflect on each phase, reinforcing the lessons imparted in every stage. And then, of course, there's cultural transmission. The structure serves as a vessel for transmitting cultural values and beliefs, norms, and ensuring that each generation internalizes these ideals. You can do this most well by providing a structure that allows this to be not just a storytelling tool, but a teaching instrument, ensuring that the wisdom of ages is passed down, understood, and internalized by each succeeding generation. But you don't have to follow the hero's journey. You can change it, you can tweak it, you can add elements, you can take away others, you can reverse the order they come in. You can even come up with your own structure, although I'm not sure that that is worth the effort, to be completely honest, but you can do it if you want to. But whatever you do, for a given group of cultures, the heroic myths should all feel the same. The structure of your myths should have elements that echo each other. This way, it feels to the reader as though these cultures are real because they have shared myth structures, the same as in our world. This also extends to stylistic elements of how the myths are told. For example, in my world of Sangwil Chronicles, on the Kisangi continent, my myths all speak of the importance of being written down versus being said because that's important in the dominant religion of the area. So a myth would also say which parts of it are written, i.e. true, and which are only said, i.e. open to interpretation. By contrast, in the Empire of Lumiaron, I start mythic tales with listen now and hear my tale. That's a bardic tradition that is used in the empire to create myths. And I use myths or myth snippets as flavor text on my chapters. So by keeping these styles consistent, I hope to give the reader a feel for the 
culture that they encounter in these books. If you've gotten value out of this video so far, consider giving it a super thanks. And let's talk about how you can create myths for your culture. First, understand the values you want to showcase. Begin by determining the core values that define your culture or society. Is this a culture that values individual prowess or collective effort? Does it prioritize wisdom over might or vice versa? This will help you ensure that your myth works with your culture and doesn't espouse values that seems antithetical to your culture. Two, identify your protagonists and your antagonists. For myths, utilize the classic archetypes that embody the values or their opposite of your society. For instance, a hero might embody perseverance, while the antagonist embodies short-sightedness or impulsivity. Ensure that while the characters may have larger-than-life qualities, they also have flaws or experiences that make them relatable to the inhabitants of your world. 3. Structure your myths. As showcased in stories like Jason and the Argonauts or The Monkey King, a classic structure involves a call to adventure, facing the trials, receiving mentorship, experiencing a climax, or abyss, and undergoing transformation. Think about the lessons you want your society to glean from this story. Each trial or challenge the hero faces should emphasize or challenge the culture's core values. 4. Integrate nuances and symbolism. Introduce elements that can be symbolically tied to the values of your society, like the golden fleece representing authority or the monkey king's circlet symbolizing restraint. The narrative style should match the cultural ethos of your world. If your society appreciates straightforwardness, then the myths should be direct. If they value allegory and interpretation, make the story layered with hidden meanings. And consider those stylistic beats that I spoke about so that your myths have stylistic elements that they share and hence feel like they come from the same culture. And five, embed the myth in daily life. Establish ceremonies, festivals, or rites of passage that commemorate events from the myth. Create songs, paintings, or sculptures, plays even, or other narratives that draw on and interpret the myth. These are things that you can describe to your readers and thus show them the impact of the myth without laboriously telling them about the myth. Ensure that the myth is part of your world's education system, allowing each generation to learn, interpret, and draw lessons from it. By considering the value, structure, style, symbolism, daily integration of the myth, you'll create a rich tapestry that feels genuine and profoundly impacts your world's inhabitants. And those are my thoughts on including heroic myths in a fantasy culture. If you want to say thanks for this video, super thanks is enabled, or you could become a channel member and get early access to my videos. If you enjoyed this video, Check out my video on creation myth. It really does help the algorithm if you click on those end videos. And I will see you soon for another one.